Salvador with Malaya, Texas. My friends are Shashi and welcome. Um, thanks for all for coming. And so uh, as an overview of uh, today's um, ED or forum or webinar, uh, next slide please. Here is an overview of what to expect for today. So first we're going to discuss or yeah, discuss the oligarchs. Uh, and then second, uh, we're going to discuss the conditions, what makes political dynasties possible, um, including historical origin, other conditions, social conditions, and global conditions. Uh, for the first part, the oligarchs, we're going to define political dynasty, its origins, um, and of course, the abuse of po political power that happens with political dynasties. And then third, uh, we're going to have some breakout rooms to um, talk about um, our personal experiences or how we are relating to the concept of political dynasties. Uh, when we come back from those, we're going to talk about uh, ways of building people power, and we are going to end with calls to action. And so before we proceed to the first section, um, we are inviting everyone to please introduce themselves in the chat, uh, your name, pronouns, organizations you're affiliated with, where you're coming from. Um, as you feel comfortable doing so. And so this event is going to be recorded and live streamed just so um, everyone's, uh, everyone knows that. Um, and so uh, also uh, throughout the session, we'll be inviting questions from the audience. So please feel free to participate via chat or if you want to unmute them yourself and um, contribute to the discussion. But yeah, all right. So are we about ready to begin? Okay, all right, cool. So uh, next slide, please. So the first section is on the oligarchs. And so um, just uh, as a pulse check, uh, do you know of any names or public figures affiliated with political dynasties and oligarchs? like uh, political figures in the Philippines that you know are affiliated with political dynasties. Yes, the Habsco Aquino, uh, Mark, uh, Jimmy said Marcos, Lorena and Jay said Duterte, yes. Uh, Michelle said Macapagal, Ayalas, Villar. Yes, all those uh, surnames. Adena, um, thank you so much for, um, yes, uh, saying these surnames that are um, familiar uh, Cayetano by the fact that they are part of political dynasties. And so to begin, uh, let's watch this four minute video entitled uh, each, each election cycle brings more power to political families study shows uh, from ABS-CBN News. Uh, do note that this video is from 2018. Uh, that is as a preview for the midterm elections in the subsequent year 2019. Uh, this just goes to show that things have not significantly changed since then. So yeah, let's go ahead and watch this video. Some political families have candidates in both national and local positions for next year's elections. In the cases of the Ejercito Estrada family of Manila and San Juan and the Binays of Makati, siblings are rivals for the same positions. And then there's the Cayetanos of Taguig and the Suarezes of Quezon, who want to secure more offices under their control. A study of the Ateneo School of Government shows that each election cycle brings more power and prominence to political families in Congress, while the number of those who don't come from dynasties have been dwindling. As of the May 2016 elections, over half of the elected congressmen came from political families. And among these political families, there has been an increase in those coming from fat dynasties or those who have multiple members occupying different positions at the same time, while the numbers of those from the so-called thin dynasties those who only have one family member holding office at a given time have also fallen. This expert notes that this concentrates power in just a few families since real political power is vested in national positions, which control the budget. Mendoza adds only a few families have served their constituents well. Totoo na mayroong mga dynasty na ipinaglaban ng development ng ating bansa. Pero mangilan-ngilan yun, ang pinakamarami sa kanila, walang ibinabago. Valenzuela City Mayor Rex Cachalian, however, notes that constituents have benefited from the synergies of having access to his brothers in Congress. The mayor has brothers in the Senate and the lower house, to whom he can take up legislation that may affect cities and endorse constituents who need more aid than the city can afford. 
may pasyenteng lalapit dito sa City Hall. Siyempre, meron tayong mga rules on how much lang maitutulong natin. Pero easily na i-refer namin siya sa office ni Congressman para sa karagdagang referral sa Department of Health. Na nare-refer natin siya kay Senator Sherwin para mailapit rin siya sa Department of Health or sa iba pang mga ayansya na makatulong. This former president, herself from a political family, points out that there is still no law implementing the constitutional ban against dynasties. Well, uh, hanggang magkaroon ng ng ano ng batas na dinedefine anong political dynasty di doon lang tayo pwedeng gumawa ng hakbang para sumunod sa batas the families meantime insist that voters are better off being left to decide the fate of dynasties on their own as some argue not all family members win their races mas marami yung natatalong pare-pareho ang apelyido kaysa sa nananalo yun nga lang prominent yung nananalo yung natatalo hindi nila iniintindi I think there's no such thing as dynasty as long as fair yung elections. Why are you going to deprive a member of, of, of your family who wants to serve sincerely? It's the people who will decide or, on our fate. Uh, so ako hindi ako masyado ninawala dyan sa political dynasty. Mendoza, however, says voters don't really have a lot of choices amid the weak political party system that should be producing new leaders while voters have started to get used to having the same surnames occupy different positions, discouraging fresh blood that may start real change from even trying to get into public office. R.G. Cruz, ABS-CBN News. All right, thank you for playing that Some video. Some political families have candidates. So from the video, uh, why do you think families stay in power for so long? Notably, the surnames that you all have mentioned in the chat are the ones who are kind of rationalizing why we must have or why political dynasties aren't that bad. Um, but why or how do you think these families stay in power for so long? Any reasons or hypothesis as to why or how they do it? Pera, yes. Um, thank you. Yes, yes. Definitely, like protection of interest, um, material benefit. If they're in public offices, the way that uh, they could use public power to uh, manage their own interests. Uh, for Marte, I think that there's reinforcement for imperialism. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Malay movement says they use their political position to perpetuate themselves in position. So definitely that cycle of um, uh, maintaining power. Uh, Ryan, nepotism, mm -hmm. like being able to put people you know in those positions, so those connections, and so that prevents other people from coming in, as the video has mentioned. So yes, thank you for participating via chat. So as you can see here in the slide, um, a political dynasty is a family of politicians, to give us a, wor a working definition, who serve in one place or country and are able to pass or extend government positions to kin for the purpose of expanding and maintaining power. And in doing so, they monopolize political power and are able to treat the public elective office as their private property. So we could see that tension between it's a public office, but the purposes is not for public good or for the people, but for private property. And connected to this is the notion of oligarchy, which is defined as a power structure in which power is placed in the hands of a small number of people uh, who are defined by nobility, wealth, political, religious, and other defining characteristics. Uh, we could see more of this later when we trace the historical conditions of um, political dynasties and how they emerged. So um, in addition to what has already been said, what are some other reasons why political dynasties are problematic? Um, what does it prevent? us from doing when there are political dynasties in place. Again, feel free to um, make comments in the chat. Or maybe another way to put it is, um, is it important to look back in history to see how political dynasties emerged and why is looking back in history important? Um, Marta said in the chat, it prevents genuine democracy. Yes, um, if by democracy you mean that everyone's able to participate, then if there's political dynasty involved, then that really prevents um, equal participation from citizens. And why is history important?
history cell weapon. Okay, uh, that can be used. Uh, and from Roberto, it seems like it is inevitable because even here in the U.S. it exists, but not to the same extent as in the Philippines. That's an interesting observation given how in the Philippines there's this notion of uh, family is the most important thing, the, the fact like how values are um, organized around the notion of family, um, whereas here in the United States there's this sense of individualism, not as attached to the value of family as much. Um, and by Marte, continuing, um, that can be used by the masses of people. So his history as a weapon, as a tool. It has said these families have been government positions like a family business. So yes, um, it's, it's like uh, the same people from the same families are running these positions. So thank you again for participating. And so next slide, please. So you can see here in this chart, um, well, families owned larger lands in sultanates. Uh, when the Spanish colonizers came, they influenced the barangay elites to become puppet leaders who controlled the land and taxes. So you could see that in the first two arrows, uh, when US colonizers maintained such feudalism, and now with the so-called Philippine independence, uh, the Philippine elite uh, still rules in a way that politically and economically benefits the US. So the interests that they have uh, conjoining with foreign interests and and the way that they use both, the intersection of both to maintain power. Um, and again, it works against the interests of the people because um, uh, it, it just goes to the upper 10, 20% um, of the Philippine elite and not really so much to uh, the masses, the peasants, um, the middle class, and so forth. So um, next slide, please. And we will talk uh, later, Erin will um, get more into the historical traditions. Uh, and for now, uh, here's a quick overview of political dynasties in the Philippines. So you might see some of the names that you mentioned in the chat here. Uh, and um, often we, these are the same names that we see running for the same posts in the government. Okay, next slide, please. And now here's a video from ANC in 2013 showing the statistics on the topic, just to provide another contextualization. To Tony Tones. Yeah, did I just hear Lexi Schultz complaining how long her shift was? <laughs> no, Lexi's a real trooper. She'll be here whenever you need her. Well, the Constitution disallows the existence of so called political dynasties, but for decades, clans have remained in control of politics both in the local and national levels. Linda Humilia tells us more about political dynasties by the numbers. In almost every election, it's a battle of the same names from the same clans. Political dynasties have always been a part of Philippine politics. Article 2, Section 26 of the 1987 Constitution says, the state shall guarantee equal access to opportunities for public service and prohibit political dynasties as may be defined by law. Data from the University of the Philippines' Halalan website show 250 political families have dominated Philippine politics at the national and local level. This represented 0.0000167% of the country's 15 million families. It adds 56% of political dynasties come from old political elites and 44% emerged after the 1986 EDSA revolution. Of the 80 provinces in the Philippines, 73 or 94% have dynasties. Data would show that six presidents will most likely have relatives in the next Senate. Osmeña, Magsaysay, Marcos, Cory Aquino, Estrada, and Noynoy Aquino. 26 years after the 1987 Constitution was ratified, Congress has yet to pass an enabling law prohibiting political dynasties. No surprise here as such a measure would force many lawmakers and their families to give up their hold to power. Linda Humilia, ABS-CBN News. Okay, uh, thank you for playing that video. So uh, just to note too, uh, this video is from 2013. So the election is in 2013. So if you're interested in a more updated mapping of major political families in the Philippines after the 2019 elections, uh, check out this article from Rappler, which I will be, uh, will someone will be dropping in the chat. 
So next slide, please. And so now, yes, the Marcos family. So given the upcoming elections, we know that Bongbong Marcos, or commonly known as BBM, um, son of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos is running for the president of the Philippines. Uh, so in addition to the bullet points that you see here, uh, what are other things that we know about the Marcos family? Uh, again, feel free to drop what you know about the Marcos family in chat. Has anyone else seen the film The Kingmaker? Yes, it is. They stole billions of pesos. They are tax evaders. So Michelle, Ferdinand and Marcus put the Philippines under martial law. Uh, Tab said they displaced the whole island of people for Imelda Safari. Yes, um, so the film I mentioned, The Kingmaker, if you haven't seen it, that documents the wealth of the Marcuses. Uh, apparently, the, the filmmaker initially was like, oh, I just want to document like Imelda's like, wealth, like the Marcuses' wealth. Um, they didn't expect to get into this like uh, rabbit hole of how it has been from corruption, martial law, and all, yeah. And he has said another mark is trying to run for president. So if you've seen in the news recently, the way that they have uh, billions of estate tax that they've yet to pay. And I saw someone on Twitter said that, oh, when they get into the positions, they're, they're going to make the Filipino people pay for that. Um, and it's going to be more corruption from there on. And then Marcus said the Marcus family once engaged in the case in the Philippines, yes, uh, 1971, um, for 20 years or so. Uh, Bernadette, ma many of their extended family are also in political positions. Isn't Imelda's relative the current Philippine ambassador to the U.S., appointed by the Duterte? Um, and Eva said, they buried workers in the film center. Um, and yes, Tab said, it's Ambassador Ramualdez. Um, and so uh, the ways that um, these political families have people in position and power and um it is ilocos like the northern part of the philippines where uh they call it the their baluarte or they're their, like uh their um where they concentrate their power and they have a lot of supporters in the area um and so thank you again for um uh, saying these things in the chat uh these are uh, some of the things that we know about the marcos family and so uh, this is really important to keep in mind because, again, as mentioned, um, Bongbong Marcos is running for president. And it's wild to think how um, after 30 or so years, they're not coming back to power after Ferdinand Marcos has been ousted by the People Power Revolution in 1986. And then now they've really um, used historical revisionism, um, fake news propaganda to say that, oh, BBM is re isn't really that bad. Or, oh, that was the golden years of the Philippines, which are all incorrect and wrong. Um, and by the way, Marcuses don't pay taxes, yes, uh, which is wild because you know how there's like a lot of disqualification cases or petitions against BBM, but then Comelec doesn't see those like valid cases to disqualify Marcos before the elections. And Lorena and Jay said, Bob Marcos is apparently running for Congress in Ilocos and can't even speak Ilocano. So that only speaks to like how the incompetence of like, that also reminds me of how Bongbong Bong doesn't even like heed the invitations to debates for like the president, there's no platform, nothing. Um, and so you can't really criticize someone who doesn't have a platform aside from they don't have platform and they have a lot of like tax evasion, histories of corruption. Uh, surely Marcos is in the Guinness Book of Record and Ives also shared shared um, a CNN article in the chat on Sandro Marcos and um, um, in Ilocos Norte. So again, thanks so much. And so keep this in mind as we move to the next slide, please, which is um, the Duterte family. So we also know that running in tandem with BVM is Sara Duterte, daughter of current Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte, who is running for the vice president post. Um, and uh, I'm curious about y'all's thoughts. Um, in addition to like, what do you know about the Duterte family aside from what's indicated in the slide? Uh, what is, um, uh, someone said on Twitter that Sandra is the real threat because if in the instance that Lenny becomes elected and Sarah gets the vice presidential post, how that will undermine Lenny, um, especially since uh, the, the 
that this have a lot of Croatians in Congress, etc. So what are your thoughts on that or in a, generally on the Duterte family? Yes, so as I said, we need a full opposition victory. So yes, that means that it's not just Lenny, but also Kiko, or yeah, Lenny, Kiko, tandem for the presidential and vice presidential post. And also the senators like Neri Colmenares, Wong Labo. Okay, so um, given the prevalence of political dynasties, uh, what has been done so far to address the, their proliferation in the government? So let's take a look at um, the next slide, please. So let's take a look at this two minute video on banning political dynasties um, from WIO News in 2018. Or um, actually we could skip that video and go to the next slide, please. So this slide shows that actually, and as y'all have seen in the previous video, not the one that we just get, um, despite the constitutional prohibition of political dynasties, like the 1987 constitution, this um, statement, uh, it is still up to the Congress to enact such law. However, how can that happen when the Congress itself is filled with political families? So according to the Philippine News Agency, uh, Senator Grace Poe said, this leads to the concentration of decision-making powers in the hands of few families, which in turn leads to a culture of palakasan. Uh, someone mentioned in the chat earlier the notion of nepotism, where preferential treatment is given to people who are close to those in power. Uh, CNN Philippines indicates that the Congress, and I quote, dropped the political dynasty ban in the version that is what's passed in December 2018. Um, Malacanang at the time called on lawmakers to reconsider controversial measures, including its dropping of the political anti dynasty ban, saying the draft charter could be rejected by the people. So it's like these officials speaking for the people that, oh, the people wouldn't want an anti political dynasty act. So uh, we can do this instead. Let's take a look at this video from ABS-CBN News back in 2020 to listen to lawmakers like Senator Neri Colmenares, the author of the Anti-Political Dynasty Bill, and their perspective on ending political dynasties. Prospects for the passage of the law, not, not without taking into consideration how it will, will um, you know, be acted upon in the Senate, but the House of Representatives lang ko. Well, uh, what is acceptable and realistic? Sa tingin mo, with, in, in your conversations with, uh, with your fellow congressmen? At this point in time, the prospect is not bright. Mm -hmm. I have to be realistic about it. Mm -hmm. That's why in my opening statement uh, during the initial conversation we had here, that I am hoping that the majority in the House of Representatives will see the light. Mm -hmm. The way I saw the light. <laughs> Because I myself is affected by this bill. Mm -mm. I have brothers uh, and sisters in the, in the public service who mm -hmm. are within the prohibited degree under the bill of uh, Congressman Culminares. Mm -mm. But I saw the light. Mm -mm. And, it, and in fact, it has become my advocacy. Mm -mm. Therefore, asking the question on whether it will pass in the House, mm -mm. I'm not so optimistic about it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at this point in time, mm -hmm. unless, however, that the president will certify it mm -hmm. and will give it an extra push mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to have it pass in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. oh. time, yes. is, time element especially. As the author of the bill, of course, I'd, like, I'd say na sa papasa, mm -hmm. but I also have to be very frank and honest here. Mm -hmm. I'm very pessimistic. Uh, mm -hmm. with the way it's going, considering the time and, you know, the composition of the House. No? So, very pessimistic. I don't, uh, it will probably take a lot of outrage from the people outside to force Congress to pass an anti-dynasty law. Mm, and, and this is not something that, you know, would normally uh, drive people into uh, a, a rage. Pork barrel, maybe, oh, oh. Uh, you know, Mama Sapano, maybe mm -hmm. political dynasty, hindi pa yan na-achieve ngayon yung level ng outrage na, gener na generate na yun. Mm -hmm. um, Attorney Monsod, 28 years after you and your fellow commissioners enshrined that particular provision in the Constitution. Uh, are we anywhere near enacting an anti-dynasty law? Well, what I can say is I'm really glad that we have people like 
Congressman Castro and Eric Ordinaris in Congress mm -hmm. to keep alive, mm -hmm. to keep alive the vision of EDSA. Mm -hmm. Because unless we really institute radical changes, social changes in our, in our country, we will remain the basket case of Asia in, in, in our part, basket case in our part of the world. Mm. And it's, it's been 28 years, it's time we get out of that. Mm. Um, is there any uh, urgency that it be enacted under this administration? It's always urgent. Uh -oh. That, that anti-dynasty law is always urgent. Mm. And uh, I, I hope uh, people don't lose hope and mm. uh, they will continue the fight. All right, so for context, this video is from 2020. And as Senator Colmenar said, it will take the people's outrage to pressure the Congress to enact the anti-political dynasty bill. So the people's outrage, like the chant of Tamana, Sobrana, and as Attorney Monsad said, one of those who drafted the 1987 constitution, the issue of political dynasties is always urgent and to never lose hope and that we continue to fight. So makibaka, wag matakot. So that has been an overview of the oligarchs and the anti-political dynasty bill. Now I'm passing it off to Aaron to talk about the conditions of political dynasties. Thanks, Jedi, for giving us a baseline understanding of what political dynasties are and the threat that political dynasties pose to democracy, human rights, and national sovereignty in the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please. So what makes political dynasties possible? Is it simply just a matter of families running and winning a fair election? How do these families even secure the opportunity to run for a political position? And will political dynasties end if we remove those individuals and their families from power? But more importantly, can fixing just electoral politics and just legislation alone achieve democracy, human rights, and national sovereignty in the Philippines? Are there other conditions that make it possible for dynastic families to stay in power from province to province to region to region? To answer these questions, we're sort of giving you this uh, larger, broader framework to look at and examine political dynasties from different angles, material, historical, global, and social conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So now, before we go further, again, Jelai earlier briefly touched on the, some historical conditions that have made political dynasties possible as a social circumstance that grew out of Spanish colonization during the feudal era through the introduction of land ownership and class and, and was institutionalized through US imperialism by excluding access to elections, politics, through various qualifications like owning land and uh, a sort of literacy to English, which left political positions to the wealthy who had that access to land and to access to education. Um, next slide, please. So I want to take up just a few points about feudalism, land ownership, and class division, because this is sort of how we can enter the, the discussion about material conditions that make political dynasties possible. First, while there were some characteristics of feudalism prior to Spanish colonization, Spain largely transformed the archipelago entirely into a feudal state, a feudal society. That is, through Spanish colonization, feudalism became the dominant economic system of production, where land ownership and class division were standardized across the islands. And as we discussed historically, these class divisions grew out of racialisms or the construction of difference from the datus and the everyday people. In short, the economic system of production that we have today, which is capitalism, was not a radical break, but rather emerged and developed and evolved from the feudal era. So on this topic of an economic system of production, why does this matter for political dynasties? Well, one way, again, is to think of the material conditions as making up the foundation on which political dynasties are built. That is, if we consider the way a society is formed and developed, there is work and labor that has to be done in order to create that society in order to produce the things that society needs from food and shelter and clothes. Societies therefore require this sort of baseline of production to survive. A system of production can generally be made up of two categories, which is what I'm going to call the material conditions, as you can see on the slide, and then the social conditions, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, uh, basically though, the, force, the material conditions, is how I'm going to sort of describe it is best understood as the materials and the means needed to produce the things that society needs to develop and maintain itself. This can broadly be categorized into three major categories, human labor power, land and raw materials, and the tools or the technological means necessary to produce those goods and services that society needs. And since these are the things that a society needs to form and survive, the material conditions then shape
structure the rest of society, laws, schools, homes, private industry, healthcare, etc. This is why the question of land ownership and labor and the politics of distributing and organizing societal resources are critical when examining the issue of dynastic families. And because it is necessary to see the limitations of government and electoral politics, examining the material conditions can offer an approach that shows political dynasties are possible because there is an unequal distribution of not just political power, but also control over society's entire system of production. So while systems of production can then vary region to region, scale to scale, the global economy is dominantly under a capitalist system of production. And this can't be taken lightly because capitalism is predicated on the creation and the accumulation of private property. That is, in creating the notion of private property, it means that there is a class of people who own that private property, whether that's labor power, land, tools, technolo technological infrastructure, and then there's a class of people who do not. That's class division. So that's sort of the idea that I'm sort of bringing here in terms of understanding political dynasties and the conditions, the material conditions that make that possible. Uh, next slide, please. And then, like I mentioned before, there's another approach, uh, which many people had mentioned this already in the chat, of different social conditions that sustain and reproduce political dynasties. Now, this is basically everything that makes up society beyond the material conditions from certain ideas, practices, institutions that shape the conditions of possibility for political dynasties to emerge. Again, political, so material conditions set the parameters for what social conditions are possible. This is because a society can only make itself based on what materials, things, and people are within its environment. Given that our current system, our current context is governed by a capitalist system, once again, this means then there is an inherently unequal control of the material conditions. And because there's inequality in that, the social conditions might be described as the sort of set of social relations that people have to enter in order to survive in the capitalist system. And because these social conditions are then shaped by our material conditions and are often used to maintain the current economic system, it's important to consider various interlocking social conditions or social forces that create those fertile grounds where political dynasties can thrive and flourish. Perhaps the most obvious is the state, right, which we have sort of discussed in the historical condition section, and we know is overrun by the wealthy classes and by these dynastic families, which ultimately make the decisions that benefit their positions in society. Now, the rest of this is going to be sort of very uh, crude, but just to give starting points for us to, to enter this, con this discussion. Another important social force then is fascism, which can broadly be defined as a political approach that seizes crisis to warrant consent for ultranationalism and authoritarian order. Like fascists of the past, Duterte, for example, engages in several fascist tactics to generate fear, discourage opposition, manipulate media, control education in schools, so forth. Uh, as an ideological doctrine that emerged in the second half of the 20th century, neoliberalism is also another dangerous structuring social force that perpetuates the capitalist system through this sort of conflation of political and market freedoms. Basically, neoliberalism is a doctrine that believes the market is the sole guarantor for all individual freedoms. Under this sort of doctrine, neoliberals have sought to privatize, deregulate, and dismantle social welfare to expand markets across society, and they've worked to sort of shrink the state to only the role of maintaining and expanding markets, thus only representing the wealthy private property owners, businesses, corporations, final financial capitalists. In other words, neoliberalism is ushering all human ideas, practices, and institutions into the marketplace as things that are transactional and contractual. The key thing about neoliberalism here, or at least what it brings to the table, is that it strengthens capitalism's immunity not by sustaining wealth accumulation by pro profit generation, but through the ongoing redistribution of wealth from the majority of the people to the upper class wealthy elites and accumulation by dispossession. This can be seen in finance, for example, which since the 1980s or so, due to deregulation, has become a sort of center for redistributive activity through determining risk, speculation, predation, fraud, for example. This can be seen as in the management and manipulation of crises through Wall Street, US Treasury, IMF, and the sort of sudden increases in interest rates that forced developing countries to developing countries to agree to structuralist adjustment programs, as well as through state redistributions, through cutbacks on public state expenditure and tax codes that privilege profit returns on investment rather than income and wages. So together, 
neoliberalism to financialization all helped to transfer the responsibility of providing social protections for citizens from the employers and the state to the individual. This point is essential for understanding the ongoing social reproduction of political dynasties, because if employers and the states are no longer in charge of providing these social protections like healthcare or housing or food security, then who is? Often individuals then turn to one place known as the family, which is often sort of perceived as a positive place of belonging, but an overemphasis on the family as the sole institution that bears responsibility for care and sustaining people is vulnerable to placing one, the burden on women, and two, it sort of creates the conditions that make possible nepotism, the favoritism of taking care of relatives, especially when in hiring practices or electoral politics. But how can we blame them when the very society we live in is founded and built on a capitalist system that is inherently divisional and unequal through the creation of private property, land ownership, racialisms, class. Now, I just want to say that having a family is not an inherently bad thing, but if our institutions and practices are structured solely around just the idea of having a family without, you know, the material conditions and social institutions needed to support other forms of community and other forms of social gathering, this can contribute to the reproduction, as we can see, of social inequality via class, race, gender, all by keeping wealth and particular private roles within the family. Now, just to finally breeze through the last few bits here, it can be sort of overwhelming to think about sort of the journey transforming these broken, unequal, undemocratic systems. But while corrupted systems that make political dynasties possible may be difficult to change, it's important to remember that society is made so it can be remade. We need to then be careful about taking on a sort of fatalistic attitude and surrendering to fate or the belief that nothing will change because one, that's inaccurate, and two, it discourages action and encourages consent with the way things are. Finally, as two major sources of information and consumption, as we've sort of talked about so uh, briefly, or at least throughout the discussion as far as media and education, like today, which gives us the capacity to learn, imagine, and build strategies of action, but they're also double-edged because they can sustain the hegemonic system of production, thus also political dynasties. Media can sustain political dynasties by telling particular stories that are fascist, neoliberal, individualist, fatalistic. Media can spectacularize events and displace historical context. While on the other hand, education is a fertile training ground for picking up certain ideas and practices. But it's also one of the most important sites of struggle because without education, or better, without learning, we will struggle to essentially overcome these material and social inequities. And we will struggle to take action because how can we take action to change something when we don't know what that something is? Thus, we need to equip ourselves and the most marginalized with the knowledge and information needed to make sense of inequality and corruption and strategize for a course of action to be making these changes. So now we're gonna move on to the next slide, please. Now, I want to sort of bring this down into a case about the US, the role of the US uh, and to sort of or at least expand in terms of global conditions, right? We reviewed the material, the historical, the social. And this slide is here to serve the reminder that the Philippines is only one society, one country, one locality within a particular set of material social conditions within a larger system, right? And so these material and social conditions operate then beyond the local, beyond the national boundaries of the Philippines across seas and continents. And because of the long, standing entanglements between the U.S. and the Philippines, we're using the, the role of over the U.S. in terms of making political dynasties possible. So if we zoom out and move our analysis from the national scale to the global scale, we can see that the global capitalist system of production is again predicated on divisions, right? Class, race, nation, country, advancing, developing, stateless, etc. To hold power in the global economy then, the U.S., for example, has invested in cheap overseas labor power through transnational corporations. It's dominated digital internet spaces through platforms such as Facebook, Instagram. It maintains nearly 800 overseas military bases around the world. It makes use of historically advantaged currency rates and special economic zones that have created those inequitable disadvantages for countries like the Philippines that fell prey to structural adjustment programs and thus became dependent on US trade and support where the US has become one of the largest foreign investors in the Philippines and the Philippines' third largest partner. Finally, it's important to consider the ideological hegemony that the US has for, if you look at the anti-crime legislation and practices 
say of the U.S. war on drugs, you'll also find no-knock house raids, mass incarceration, police brutality. In the U.S., the medium of drugs has been used to justify the racializing and dehumanization of certain people, Black people and brown people, and these structural logics have been exported to places like the Philippines. Even when we speak of U.S. imperialism, it implies race because it is a subjugation of Filipino peoples below U.S. peoples. And it is in this racializing dehumanization process where we can find the conditions of possibility for displacement and expropriation of the Lumad, the indigenous, the impoverished rural communities. And in the context of the Philippines, Duterte's war on drugs then also finds its historical origins in imperial, imperial colonial, and racializing tactics. This points to the significance of world history and global context as there are larger shaping forces that make violence possible in the Philippines. Next slide, please. So that was a lot, but just to sort of recap, again, historical conditions, material, social, global, these are all four different ways in which we can enter this conversation about political dynasties. Now, we are going to move into breakout rooms now, just so then, now that we have this vocabulary, and um, I believe Michelle is going to drop some questions in for us into the chat, and then, uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. Thank you. So we are going to have four breakout rooms and each of the facilitators will be assigned to the breakout rooms. And uh, we are also copying and pasting the questions in the chat, um, just so we have a copy of them. Um, and so uh, here we go. Uh, two, two. All right, um, here we go. And so, okay, yes. I was muted. All right. Thanks, everyone. My name is Hias. I'm from Malaya Movement, um, San Diego. Um, and I hope you all had some like fruitful discussion in the breakout rooms. And I hope people got to talk about whether or not we can actually um, end political dynasties, right? Because it doesn't sound like a very good system to have. Um, I hope that's what people are taking from this. Um, so yeah, you know, we got to end it. Um, and how do we end it? It's really about, you know, removing that power from those very few and then really building the people power, right? Um, so yeah, as Yves said, feel free to share some of the thoughts from the discussions here. Um, a lot of them might be related to what we'll be tackling um, in the next couple of slides. So yeah, um, next slide, please. Um, is a different system possible? Who here have heard their family members say like, oh, it's always going to be the same. That's just how things are in the Philippines, right? Um, we just keep changing precedents, but they're all the same. Um, and so people are just tired, right? Um, so yeah, like, you know, put it in the chat if you've heard that those kinds of comments or even like, Oh, those activists, they just keep complaining. They, they, they're not going to change anything, right? Puro reklamo lang sila. Um, so those are all kind of like the fatalism that Aaron is talking about, right? Um, but, you know, it's been so entrenched, but I think we have to believe that a different system is possible to be able to make it, right? So let's explore some of the ways um, that we even, you know, as, as small as we feel sometimes as individuals, how we can be, um, building towards a bigger change, right? So next slide, please. Um, oops, no, yes, yes, next slide. <laughs> so yeah, what we really need to build is to, to tackle the political dynasties is to build people power, right? Because it's very disheartening to see how long ago in history it started back to the even pre-colonial to the Spanish colonization, American colonization, and until now. So that's a lot of things. Uh, it's a very long history, um, but it will take a lot of work. 
um, to break down political dynasties, but we can do it, right? Um, they are very organized. Um, and so we must be also very, be very organized to address that. Um, so since we're approaching Philippine elections, it's very important to talk about that. So we'll talk about that first and then the many other ways to tackle it. Um, so there's many ways, right? So next slide. The first thing we'll talk about is um, how do we change it, you know, or at least some aspects of it um, through electoral politics? Because, you know, I think in the video with Neri Colmenares, they're trying to file a bill against political dynasties, but how do you do that? How do you pass that in a Congress that's full of political dynasties, right? Um, but we can have people there who, who can really expose what's going on in there, um, who can try their best to pass legislations that reflect the needs of the everyday people, right? Um, and there are people there. So people that um, Malaya is choosing to endorse, right? For example, are um, the ones who are able to at least assert some things um, in this very um, deeply entrenched system of political dynasties, right? So people like um, from the Makabayan block, right, have written a lot of um, legislations, tried to pass them in the House, um, people like Sara Ilago, um, Carlos Zarate, Ipenya Kulamat, Kuyamat, and Crispin Beltran. And if you look at, you know, their histories, they're really um, trying to pass legislation that actually reflect um, what people in the streets are calling for, right, um, including that thing about um, ending political dynasties, right, ending corruption, um, better educational systems, fighting for indigenous people, workers' rights. Um, and they don't always pass because of the nature of political dynasties, but they're there um, to try to assert. Um, so that's, yeah, we, we recognize the limits of electoral politics. Um, so next, but it's important to be there too. But next slide, um, there's other ways. Um, and it's something, you know, how many people here have been in protests? Um, I'm pretty sure a whole chunk of you have participated in demonstrations, protests, but maybe some have not. And maybe some carry this, like, you know, a lot of Filipinos look down on protesters and say, like, oh, you're just complaining. But it's really a show of um, power, right? Like, show that a lot of people um, are, have these demands and we want to show on the elected officials that we have these demands. We want to get heard, right? Make some noise. Um, but it's not only for people in office, it's also for the public, right? Imagine if there's um, a Tito or Tito on the street who like saw your placard and it really resonated with them. Um, they will be more motivated to participate in this bigger change that they're creating. Um, but of course, this is not the only way um, that the change happens, right? It's not the only way activism happens. Um, there's, you know, even deeper work that happens, but it's it's more like an exposition of what we are calling for, an exposition of our power, of our people power. Um, so next slide. Yeah, shout out to people who have been there um, against the dictatorship back then, right? There's people here from people power one, people power two, and whatever is gonna happen <laughs> in the next months, right? We have to be prepared for that and really mobilize people. That's when we're gonna show our force. Um, and what are these protests? What are these actions, right? Without all these creative practices, um, all the art, all the placards that we see, the songs that we heard. Um, if you're in the, able to put in the chat, like, you know, you can share maybe like if you've been moved by seeing an artwork or a song in a protest or somewhere else, um, which brought you here, right? I know some people here might have read a book an article um, or saw something that resonated with them, a video um, that made them feel like, okay, something is possible, right? Um, or I can participate in this. Because some of the things it can really help with, like um, basically arts and literature um, can do is one, it can show like Kingmaker, right? Um, it can show what's happening, exposing all the wrongs um, of the system, exposing what's going on with political dynasties. Um, so many people have, you know, their eyes opened um, when they saw Kingmaker, right? Um, and so exposing, um, it can also help us see what we need to do, right? Like if we see like a theater production showing 
um, collective action, like a picket line winning, like it, it can help workers realize that, oh yeah, we can like build that against this company, right? And get our rights um, acknowledged, right? Um, yeah. And also, um, lastly, also help us imagine the possibilities of the future, right? Um, because it, some things don't exist fully yet, you know, like how can we um, imagine? It's like we can really use creative practices, arts, songs, poetry, um, <clears throat> um, what is possible, right? Um, next slide, education. Um, yeah, and so it doesn't stop there. We can protest, we can like have creative practices, but if we are not um, very, um, you know, if we don't have a full understanding of one, what we're fighting for, what are we fighting against, right? Um, it'll be very hard to keep fighting um, if we don't have that common language, um, common understanding of what's going on. Um, so different forms, right? Um, this thing, like having an educational discussion like this, um, having film screenings, um, fighting for um, more critical educations, right? Like ethnic studies, um, or even informal reading groups. Like I know some Malaya chapters actually started from like um, reading uh, like book clubs, right? Of um, what was that book? Um, Patron Saints of Nothing, right? Um, that gives a shout out to the Malaya movement. Um, and so like reading groups like that really help have those discussions. Um, you should also study Malaya movement statements, right? To understand, oh yeah, why are we endorsing Lenny, right? <laughs> why are we endorsing all these people? Um, and then if we don't understand that, oh, we actually have a justice and accountability agenda of people's demands, um, then maybe people will end up thinking like, oh yes, the election will be the only solution, right? Um, so we need to um, understand issues deeper, right? Um, we need to understand political dynasties that it's not just like, yeah, that's it, you know, we can't ever change it. Um, we need to talk about it deeper. And so, yeah, and then, Yes, we just talked about eliminating the material conditions that lead to political dynasties, right? And knowing how to really change things. Um, so that's very important, right? Education. Um, imagine if we're not learning all these things, it would be so hard to talk to the everyday people as well. Um, next slide. And at the very, very core of what we do, right? There's a reason why Malaya movement is called a movement and not just Malaya. Um, it's not just Malaya individuals, right? Um, it's a whole movement. We're trying to organize the people. Um, and the Philippines has a very rich experience, right? It's not just Malaya who's doing this organizing, like um, local communities in the Philippines are doing community organizing and you know, they have like different projects that really uplift um, the demands of the people, like that really address the needs and really show that people can actually govern themselves, right? We don't need just like this one president um, who, who's just like dictating everything for their own individual interests. Like we can see already that there is a basis um, for the people of the Philippines governing themselves. Um, so some examples here, um, how many people here have heard of the community pantries in the Philippines, right? The, the mutual aid efforts where um, people just put out produce. Um, it started from a small cart, right? Um, that just said like, take what you need, um, give what you can and take what you need. Um, and then just people just like saw that and then it turned into this big thing of having like thousands of community pantries in the Philippines. Um, and they even ended up having like bigger systems, right? Like buying produce from farmers who have not been able to sell their, um, their stuff, like all these eggplants and what's that, okra, um, that's going to rot because they can't afford to pay the middleman to bring it to the city and sell it for them. Um, people in the community pantry bought those produce, paid the farmers properly, and then redistributed it to people for free, you know, and people were donating so that that could happen. And so the basis is there um, and the Philippine economy, the resources of the Philippines can really sustain everyone. Um, we don't have to have people who are hungry. Um, we just need proper, um, like, you know, governance and people really um, having that kind of agency. And so, um, next, so that's one example, right? And it's, 
it's temporary, right? Um, but it really shows um, what the possibilities could be, right? That we can really do it if we just like have that sustained um, long-term vision that Ives is mentioning in the chat, right? Um, next slide. Um, just some other examples too of just like really building people power. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I saw some of these examples in the Philippines, like farmers cooperatives, right? It's not a new concept, um, but it's very interesting how it's going on in the Philippines. Like um, the picture on the left is um, farmer, farm workers organizing in Hacienda Luisita, like a big land owned by the Cahuancos, right? Um, and those, that's private land that they're on. Um, they're, they're basically occupying and then they decided to like plant crops to organize themselves um, and really start to learn how to um, sustain themselves. Um, but they're constantly under attack, um, but they also use their people power, their, their organization to also keep defending themselves and asserting themselves and strengthening themselves. Um, so yeah, these are people who create our daily food, you know, our sugar, um, and they don't have access to what they're producing, um, but they have the knowledge, they have the power to be able to do that, and they're starting to plant th those seeds. Um, on the right is an example of urban poor communities, right? Um, we know that in the Philippines, there's a lot of, um, you know, like what we call like slums, right? Um, people just like occupying land um, and just like building houses from whatever they have, right? They're coming from the countryside in the Philippines um, and they have very little access to good food. Like there's a lot of junk food um, and it's too expensive for them as well to buy healthy food. Um, but they started um, occupying some areas that were actually demolished by um, the private owners. Um, they occupied it and started planting their own gardens, you know, so that they can have healthier food. Um, and so, yeah, again, like these are examples of how there is basis for us to build people power. And these are the seeds that can really topple um, political dynasties in the long run if we really have that long-term vision. Um, and so there's some questions. Let me just look at the chat. Um, yeah, how can we jail these dynasties? Um, that's all part of our justice and accountability agenda, right? Like um, trying to assert through our people power um, that these people need to be held accountable. Like even going through our international, um, you know, international things like the International Criminal Court or the UN, right? Um, but we also can't expect that it will just happen if like only one or two file those cases. Like, but imagine if so many people across the world and not even just Filipinos, like really pressure these bodies, um, you know, not just sign petitions, but be out there in the streets, um, send all the letters to them um, saying that, no, you know, um, we want them to be held accountable and um, that can really put pressure to make those things happen. So yeah, just like really emphasizing the importance of organizing, movement building um, and people power and educating um, each other um, in really toppling the political dynasties. It's gonna be a lot of work. Um, it's gonna be a long run. It will be beyond these, this election and we need to keep building the movement um, beyond the elections, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know if people have anything to add, any of the facilitators for um, the building people power part, but this is re these are really just some examples of, um, yeah, the alternatives, right? It is possible and all of us have something to contribute. We might feel very small sometimes as individuals, but when we put all our forces together, um, we can really make a big, big difference, right? Um, <clears throat> So if people don't have anything to add, we can move to some calls to action. Yes. All right. So what are the things we can do as individuals, as Malaya, right? Um, next slide, please. To change um, what's going on. We're, we're not only changing political dynasties, right? I think some people in the chat, um, in the focus groups, the breakout rooms are mentioning the material conditions that also need to change. Um, so the calls to action also go beyond that. Um, so thanks for putting these in the chat. Those are the calls to action, but um, next slide. 
these are what we can do. So first of all, you know, I mean, we're talking about elections and we know that there, there is some kind of difference that we can also get um, from that, right? So we want to um, share the news that Malaya Movement, you know, as a whole organization is endorsing Lenny Robredo, Kiko Pangalinan, and for senators, we're endorsing Neri Colmenares, Elmer Labog, and the Bayamuna party list, right? Um, so just making sure that we at least have some people who we can assert to, right? Like we can um, hold account accountable with the people's um, the demands, the justice and accountability agenda. Um, so yeah, if you don't know what we're talking about, um, study the justice and accountability agenda, sign it and share it, you know, like don't make it just like stay with you, like share it to your tito and tita and your nanay and tatay and siblings, um, everyone who's disillusioned in the Philippines, like a lot of people know that many things are going wrong. Um, so imagine if they see all these things like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm down to sign it. Um, it will be a good place to start conversation with them, right? Um, and if you want to learn more too and be part of more discussions, there's a weekly talakayan, which means discussion. Um, it's happening on Facebook live stream um, on the, about the presidential debate. So like, how can we convince someone to vote one over the other if we, know, we don't know what's going on in these things, right? So that's every Sunday, um, 5 p.m. in Pacific, 7 Central, 8 and Eastern. So yeah, I don't know, all these time conversions, but Sundays, yeah, if you're free, you're looking for something to do and want to enrich your knowledge, um, yeah, join those discussions. Um, donate, um, a lot of people are already donating their time and effort and energy, but there's some very material things like Zoom accounts and all these things that we still need to do for Malaya, um, but actually requires money. So if you do have some extra, please donate. Um, to Malaya Movement, so that's very tangible, right? Um, and if you're not yet a part of Malaya Movement, please join Malaya. Um, yeah, and so that you can really um, put your individual efforts with the collective and we can really move as a whole um, forward, right? And if you're already a member of Malaya Movement, um, it is the responsibility and the duty of each member to also recruit new members because we're movement building, right? Um, how can we convince others that they can change things? Um, and we can really show them by participating in organizations. Um, so yeah, um, get your friends who are interested in these things to join. If they don't even know about it, tell them about it. Um, but we need to build this movement. So um, that's our calls to action. Um, yeah. I, I think that's it for today. Um, I don't know if we assigned anyone to close the discussion. No, um, no thanks, Hia, yeah. so much. All right. Sorry thank for keeping you. you all for a few minutes over. But thanks again for coming. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Salamat, Ingat. Yeah. Join Malaya.